I'm Jeff Whitmer. I'm filling in for Nick Horton today for the next uh, in a series of webinars for the Journal of Statistics and Data Science Education. And today's speakers are Pip Arnold and, and Chris Franklin. Uh, let's move on to the, so Pip's gonna be running the slides for us today. And this is a picture of me from when I had hair, that's a long time ago. I'm currently the editor of the, of the journal. And we have upcoming webinars in the in this series. There's the URL you can go to to sign up for any of the webinars. They all cost the same. That is, they're all free. They are recorded, and we will post the slides uh, later after the webinar is over. Uh, you'll be able to uh, look at the slides and recording on the website. I'm not sure how quickly that gets put up, but I think it's uh, pretty fast. And previous webinars are available also if you missed one of them. Uh, U.S. Cats is is coming up. June 28th through July 1st, only $25 registration. It's a very good deal. It's uh, sponsored by, by Cause, the folks who are helping us with this webinar. And it's a great uh, conference. Unfortunately, it's, uh, you know, we'll be doing um, Zooming instead of in person, but uh, such is life these days. Um, also the undergraduate stat project competition and stat research conference uh, deadlines coming up. Information is uh, shown to you there at those, uh, those two URLs. So take a look at that. I used to be a judge of the project competition. It's interesting stuff. I invite you to take a look at that work. And then a few words about our two presenters. So what happened here was Pip and Chris wrote a paper that uh, JSDSE published, uh, or I guess it hasn't quite come out officially. Uh, it's been, I think it's been posted as online. Um, and, and so there, we, what we do is have a, a talk based on one of the more outstanding papers that we have accepted. And so Pip and Chris are the speakers. Uh, Chris is a stat educator. So she masks, masquerades as a math educator um, with interest. Oh, she, she moved on too quickly for me. Um, she's down in, in New Zealand, right? Um, where it's actually winter uh, or becoming winter there. So um, uh, she works at, in Auckland uh, on integrating stats across the curriculum. And then Chris Arnold, Chris, Franklin is in Georgia. Uh, Chris is probably best known as the woman who can't find a, a short sleeve shirt that has actually uh, shoulders on it. Uh, she always have her, has her shoulders uh, exposed. No one's ever figured out why she's that way, but you know, statisticians are strange and she's a statistician. Um, she's in Georgia. She has done a lot of things in the stat ed world, including uh, the, the gays uh, pre-K-12, uh, both the 2005, she chaired that uh, committee and then the updated the gaze two it was co-chair of that one and 2015 the statistical education for teachers uh, document uh, she was chair of that uh, that project <clears throat> she was a ap stat chief reader and a fulbright scholar which took her to new zealand where she met pip so now that COVID is loosening up and people are having the chance to travel pretty soon you might choose to travel to georgia or to new zealand uh, choose new zealand with that introduction, we'll turn things over to the speakers, Pip and Chris. Oh, I should say, uh, if you have questions, uh, send them to the chat. We'll handle questions toward the end uh, after about a half hour of presentation. Okay, well, Jeff, thank you. Uh, I've known Jeff for a long time, and Jeff, that's exactly the introduction I thought you would give me. <laughs> thank you. Pip and I are very excited that we have this opportunity to uh, talk today about this paper that is about to come out in the Journal of uh, Statistics Education, or I should say Statistics Education, let's see, Journal of Statistics and Data Science Education. I have to get used to the longer title now. Um, and I I'm going to begin by talking just a little bit about uh, the Gaze document, which was kind of a motivator for this paper. And uh, then Pip's going to start you through an example illustrating uh, much of the work that's in the paper. So for many of you that may not be familiar with the Gaze, the pre-K through 12 Gaze guidelines, it was in November of 2020 that the pre-K through 12 Gaze 2 was published. And this, of course, was endorsed by the American Statistical Association, but also the National Council for Teachers of Mathematics. And GAZE 2 incorporates enhancements and in new skills that are needed for making sense of data today, 
while maintaining the spirit of the original pre-K through 12 gaze, which was published in 2005. Now, core to the GAYS-2 document is still the statistical problem-solving process. But if you're familiar with GAYS-1, you'll notice that there's been a slight tweaking in some of the wording. For example, it's now formulate statistical investigative questions. Now it is collect, consider the data. And then the third component, analyze the data. And the fourth component, interpret the result. So for example, we change the consider, collect, we consider the collect the data to collect, consider the data because of the immense secondary data that is now available where data might be considered and this could be the first step of the statistical problem solving process. Also, still as in gaze one, we have our three levels, A, B, and C. So from 2005 to now, more research has occurred in statistics education and data have expanded and evolved. And the updated GAYS-2 accounts for these changes while highlighting needed skills such as questioning throughout the statistical problem solving process. Several of the updated examples have a science focus and we address technology where possible. So Pip and I began discussing this paper in 2015 when we were together in New Zealand. And this paper was written to address the ideas around questioning that wasn't explicit within GAYS-1 and also to connect the mathematical practices to the role of questioning. Now, if you, as you read the paper, you'll see that it refers to the original GAYS framework as the paper was written before GAYS-2 was actually published, even though the published date for our paper is going to be after GAYS-2, and as we like to say, the joys of revision. Thanks, Chris, for the introduction, and kia ora. I'm Pip Arnold, and I'm based in Auckland, New Zealand, but currently I'm on the Thames coast, which is a couple of hours from Auckland today, not normally hanging out here. Anyway, today we're going to have a look at the four types of questions that are present within the statistical problem solving cycle. And I think about questions as questions we formally pose and questions we spontaneously ask as an interrogative process. The first type of question that we're going to look at today in the presentation is interrogative questions. And these are the questions we ask as checks and balances throughout the entire problem solving process. And we'll model the use of these, these interrogative questions throughout our presentation today. This slide just gives you a taste of the types of questions they might be or what they might look like. But it, but it does show quite clearly that interrogation or interrogative questions happen right across the statistical problem solving process from formulating a statistical investigative question through to interpreting results. So in the pursuit of student own problem solving and communication, the standards for mathematical practice explain the way students should be engaged during instruction every day. This is no less true when students embark on the study of statistical concepts. The statistical problem solving process provides ample opportunity at each of the four components for reasoning and developing conceptual understanding and sound habits of mind. In the statistical education of teachers document, the eight standards for mathematical practices are described through a statistical lens. If you'll notice, these mathematical practices make sense of problems and persevere to solve them, construct viable arguments and critique the reasoning of others, and look for and express regularity in repeated reasoning. They align with the intent of interrogative questions to maintain those checks and balances. For example, interrogating posed questions is seeking to persevere in making sense of and critiquing the initial posed questions. Are those posed questions answerable? And will data co 
collections questions assist in answering the posed investigative question. So even at a young age, Gage too promotes elementary students being presented with data in non-traditional forms and learning how to question and make sense of that data. One of the new more science-focused examples in Gaze 2 is about ladybugs. Suppose students in an elementary class have been reading a book or book about ladybugs. They notice that the ladybugs illustrated in the books vary in size, color, and number of spots. They wonder what a typical ladybug looks like. So how might the students investigate? There are places where teachers can order live ladybugs for this investigation, but an alternative is for teachers to assist students in searching the internet for photo cards that allow students to observe a variety of ladybugs. Here are photos of the Asian lady beetle, one of the more variable species in the world with a range of color forms. How might students make sense of these photo cards to investigate what a typical ladybug looks like. So we look at statistical investigative questions and with beginning students, teachers will need to provide more guidance when coming up with an investigative question. This is the overarching question that begins the investigation. From level B, students should be posing their own investigative questions, understanding what makes a good investigative question. An investigative question can be summary or des descriptive, like the first two questions that are posed on the slide, or it could be a comparing or a comparison question like the last question posed. The investigative questions that are here tell us about the variable of interest, for example, in the second question, the number of spots, the group we're interested in, in this case, ladybugs, it signals a type of investigation. So the first two questions signal that we're going to do a summary type of investigation and the third one, a comparison. The question can be answered with the data we have or the data we plan to collect. That's interesting and purposeful and it's about the whole group, not just an individual. Investigative questions could also be about associations or time series. If we think about what makes a good investigative question, this provides us with the prompts to interrogate the question. For example, when we look at those questions there, we can say, who are we wanting to know about? What variable are we wanting to know about? Can I tell that from the question? The key thing is, can I answer the investigative question with the information I have in the photographs? Making sense of questions begins with formulating the investigative question that leads to the data collection. Reasoning abstractly might be seeking clarity of the variables and how to obtain measurements in the data collection process. Whoops, excuse me, whoops, wrong one. I'm in the data collection one. This is the statistical investigative question. So the mathematical practices that we might use here are make sense of problems, reason abstractly and attend to precision. So these, uh, these questions, uh, so I was in the correct one. Making sense of problems begins with formulating the investigative question that leads to data collection. Reasoning abstractly might be seeking clarity of the variables and how to obtain measurements in the data collection process. And precision can relate to language, such as naming the intended population and specifying the variable names and unit measurements. When we move into the collect consider stage of the statistical problem solving process, beginning level A students might look at just one variable, like the number of spots. This is a quantitative variable. And to answer the investigative question, how many spots do ladybugs typically have, this would be sufficient. However, it is always more interesting, and as students advance through level A, students can consider multiple variables, like the color of the lady, I wanna say bird's body, because that's what we call them, but the ladybug's body, or the color of these spots as well, which are both categorical variables. 
And in fact, to answer the comparative investigative question we had, do red ladybugs tend to have more spots than black ladybugs? The color of the ladybug's body would need to be noted. Data collection questions, another type of question, need to be developed with the aim of collecting the information that will begin to answer the investigative question. A survey question is another example of a data collection question. Students can use data cards to organize the variable values for each ladybug picture where each data card represents a case, the ladybug picture, and these are shown above the table. These physical data cards can assist with beginning students to develop understanding about what is a case, which is a challenging concept for even advanced students in AP statistics. For example, here we have a ladybug. She has six, or he has six black spots in a red body. And another ladybug in a photo has 10 black spots and an orange body. And that's what those two data cards are representing. Students might then create a table, which is also shown to identify the variables for each of the photographed ladybugs. And again, when we come back to thinking about the interrogative questions, even when we're developing our data collection questions, we should be interrogating the questions. So what is a spot? Is, does a blemish count as a spot? They might define the difference between a blemish and a spot. They might not, they might decide not to, to count the spots that are on the margins of the alutru, which is the hard wing cover. Or what if the photo is not clearly focused? Do you use it or discard it? Young students need to be exposed to messy data, letting them wrestle with how to make sense of that messiness by interrogating the data. Interrogative questions at this stage of the process ask students to clarify how they're measuring the variable, e.g. what is a spot? Do we count the spots on the heads? How do we count the spots if we can't see all of the ladybug? So two mathematical <laughs> practices that might apply here with data collection questions would be use appropriate tools strategically and attend to precision. Using appropriate tools aligns with developing data collection questions, how to administer the questions and thinking about how the questions will be analyzed. For example, should we use multiple choice or open response questions? Attending to precision relates to careful wording in the questions to minimize the possibility of biased answers. After the data is gathered, it's useful to graph the data. At beginning level A, students might use a picture graph that allows each ladybug to be identified, but as students advance, they can use more abstract graphs such as a dot plot. Teachers should support level A students in thinking about distribution, which includes understanding the median as a middle value, describing the variability in the distribution, such as describing the range. To answer questions about certain color ladybugs, separate dot plots with the same scale can be stacked on top of one another. These can either be hand-drawn or created using technology. Analysis questions are created and might prompt some different representations or even some different data collection. Examples of analysis questions are given on the slide. These are the questions that help us to write the description of the data. Analysis questions include questions that help us read the graph, e.g. what is the most common number of spots for a red ladybug? What is the most common number of spots for an orange ladybug? And to read within the graph, e.g. between what number of spots do most ladybugs have? What color ladybug has the least number of spots? Analysis questions are not usually formally posed. They, te they are things that we use spontaneously in our head. And as teachers, we would be modeling our students these questions out loud. But when we do this as adults and we're looking at a graph, we're asking all these questions in our head. We don't verbalize them. When we work with kids, we need to verbalize them. As with the other stages of the statistical problem solving process, we should be interrogating all the activities within the analyze, analyze data stage. For example, the types of displays, the features we notice, and have we answered our investigative question. 
I think it's key to just note that the interrogative questions are not just interrogating other types of questions, they're interrogating the entire process. So mathematical practices that can apply at this stage are reason abstractly and quantitatively, model with mathematics, attend to precision, and look for and make use of structure. Abstract and quantitative reasoning is necessary for exploring and interpreting data in context. Statistical modeling of the data incorporates both mathematical structure plus accounting for variability. Precision comes about by asking good analysis questions to utilize appropriate graphical displays and summary statistics. Precise communication of the results is crucial. As the analysis questions are developed and answered, they, aim, they aid in answering the investigative question. Teachers should encourage the level A students to state their conclusions in terms of the sample, but then the students can be, begin to think about the feasibility of inferring to a larger population of ladybugs. Here we conclude, among other things, that ladybugs in our sample with a red body tend to have more spots than, lady, than a ladybug or ladybugs with black bodies. The students are reminded these are species of Asian lady beetles. How would they feel about inferring this conclusion to another species type? Or we might have to ask students to begin informally reasoning about classification. For example, we might ask for the Asian ladybug, if I picked one of the ladybug cards out of the hat and it had six spots, what color do you predict it would be? In the interpret results stage of the problem solving process, we interrogate our interpretation. Does it answer the investigative question we posed? Does what we have found make sense with what we know about ladybugs? This is a key part of the criticized element of the interrogative cycle. Wild and Fancock 1999 paper talks a lot about the interrogative cycle. Our intent with the paper was to elaborate further on the different purposes in the statistical problem solving process and to provide a backdrop for the changes in GAZE 2, where the use of questions throughout the statistical problem solving process is one of the signal changes. Making the distinction between question purposes is not easy, but over time it becomes clearer as we challenge ourselves and ask what type of question is this? Should I be naming it? Do I know how to name it? Okay, that's that's our presentation. Chris, do you want to add anything? Oh, uh, I think what we wanted to do in this presentation was try to show you uh, the connection of how important it is to clearly define the type of statistical question you're answering. Uh, one of the major concerns that came out of Gaze 1 is that even though we attempted to define what we call a statistical question, that's a question that you need data in order to answer and one that has variability, it really became confusing as to all the other types of questions that we asked during the statistical problem, problem solving process and where do those questions fit. And do we call that a statistical question by the definition that we gave in the original document? So hopefully the, this will help to clarify for teachers, students, practitioners, number one, the different types of questions we ask, but more importantly, how, it, how it's necessary that we're always questioning as we go through the statistical problem solving process. Okay, so we're open to questions. People can, can uh, type into the chat if you have a, a question and we will, I'll feel those questions and direct them to, to Pip and, and Chris. And while we're waiting for questions to come into the chat, which I'm not seeing any there yet, um, I have a question for, uh, for Pip and Chris. So you, you've outlined four types of questions, investigative, a survey and data collection questions, analysis, and then interrogative questions. And you said things about uh, analysis questions uh, are the most common. What are the useful next steps for us as educators in thinking about uh, regarding what different types of questions? Right? What are the next uh, 
things we should be thinking about as educators and next steps. Pip, you want me to take that or you want to go first or? Um, I, I can make a start. So what, so I'm assuming this is a question here you're throwing at us, Jeff. Yep. I, th I think one of the biggest challenges I find with working with teachers is the language that we use. Mm -hmm. And I know that when I've worked with colleagues and writing papers and they will just write, and you should pose a question and then you should ask students questions and they just use question without that naming bit. So really clear about the naming, which we've talked about. So that's identifying when we're using the four different types and call it out. So for example, if you're working with students and you've got a box plot or you've got a dot plot and students, you want them to talk about it, and you might say to them, what are some questions we can ask of the graph? That's what we'd say generally. But what we need to do is say, what are some analysis questions we might ask of this graph? So it takes a little bit to, for us to get more comfortable with naming them because it's so easy to just say, oh, what are some questions you want to ask of this graph? I think the other thing that's really important for me is that when we're posing questions, such as investigative and data collection questions, that's a really formal process. And we're very careful about that. And so if we don't get our data collection or our survey question right, we might not gather the data that we need. So I think thinking about those two as being more formally posed and the other two types as being a bit more spontaneous, they don't have to be perfect, they're happening in the moment that's quite a good way for teachers to start to differentiate between the two as well. Chris? Yes, I have to totally agree with uh, just what Pip said. Uh, I think that it's, it's important for teachers also uh, when they're working with students to always encourage questions. And I think by thinking about the different types of questions, as Pip was saying, question posing versus question asking. Question posing is where we wanna focus on trying to be more precise uh, with our language, with defining exactly what we're asking a question about. But at the same time, we really want our students, we wanna encourage them to notice, to wonder, to just ask inquisitive questions. And we're not concerned with whether there's a right answer or a wrong answer, but that we want students to always be questioning. And so I think that by distinguishing the different types of questions, this really helps people to um, maybe more fully question through the statistical problem solving process. And I think today more than ever, this is really crucial, especially where we're using big data. And it's so easy to take secondary data to maybe try to answer a statistical investigative question, but then not really ask those interrogative questions about the data and whether it's really appropriate to answer the posed question. So um, I think PIP's research is, is coming out at a very crucial time for all the different types of data analysis that we have going on and the different types of data types that we're working with. We were been asked if we could show the last slide about questioning. Uh, so Pip, you could back up that last slide about questioning. <clears throat> and then one uh, comment that came in, uh, like the inclusion of secondary data to consider um, and comparison questions, an emphasis on how variable was defined. Uh, Ladybug starts with collected data, but how about an example with a uh, secondary? Data. So Ladybug starts with collected data. Do you have an example with secondary data? So I just want to confirm that I would um, the Ladybug is we've got the data card. So we've got we're starting with some photographs. We then pose some questions, investigative questions, and then we pose some data collection questions, and then we collect the data. Um, I would think that if we were going to start with secondary data, so existing data, we would do one of two things. So we might have started with an investigative question that we want, that we know we can probably go and find some existing data. 
And so we would start with the posing our, or formulating our statistical investigative question, considering existing data and then carry on. Or what might happen, which is quite common in classrooms, is a teacher finds a really groovy data set that they think this would be really exciting for our students, for my students to use. And in that case, we start with the data. And so I would suggest at that point, the students need to interrogate that data set by looking at who collected the data, when was it collected, why was it collected, what are the variables, how were the very what data um, collection questions were asked to get the variables. And then once they have a really good understanding of the concepts, the context of the data set, they can pose their statistical investigative questions. So the cycle gets moved around a bit. And I think that's one thing that teachers are not necessarily always comfortable with. We don't always start with a problem or our statistical investigative questions. Sometimes we start with the data and then we pose our statistical investigative questions from that data set. So that's how I would see it. It would just be the cycle rearranged a little bit, but you're still going through the process. In fact, you're doing a lot more interrogation initially with existing data sets than you would with a data collect where you're going to go and collect the data. Thanks. And I guess the slide we want to end with three questions. Um, I'm not sure which slide number that is, Pip. So there are three questions. Are those the ones we were looking for? Is that what you're talking about there or are you talking about something else? I'm not sure because it's uh, someone else who's asking to see a particular slide. But while we're waiting, um, another question that came in was, how do your statistical questions fit with making them testifiable slash rejectable versus just verifying them? And it is the right slide, by the way. So thank you, Pip, for hitting the right slide. <laughs> but the question I, I just uh, posed again from one of our participants is, um, how do your statistical questions fit with making them testable slash rejectable versus just verifying them? So I'm going to confirm we're talking about statistical investigative questions here, the question that we is our big problem that we want to answer. And so in the paper, we have, a, well, in my PhD research, I came up with six criteria for what makes a good investigative question. And that um, I attended to those in, briefly, let me just go back, because it, it's one of those things when you're on the spot and you try and remember exactly what the six criteria, but basically the criteria are, is the variable clear? So do we know what variable we want to know about? Is the group clear for little kids? With, with older students, when we're doing sample to population, we would say, is the population clear? Does the question signal the type of investigation I'm going to do? Am I clear from reading the question, whether it's a summary situation or a comparison situation or an association or time series? Can I answer that question with the data I have? That's for secondary data sets. Or can I collect the data to answer this question for primary situations? Is the question about the whole group? So what kids will do is they'll say, oh, who's the tallest? That's not an investigative question. And then the last criteria that I have, and, I, and this one is a, almost the most important when we're working with students, is is the question interesting or purposeful? And if it's neither of those two things, then actually it doesn't matter how flash all the other stuff is, if it's not interesting or purposeful, why would we do it with our students? So I think, when I, so when I did my PhD, I was very, very, very much looking at could kids formulate good investigative questions and how could I decide whether they were good or not. And so that was the criteria that over a number of rounds of research that we came up with and it held. And recently I've been doing some work on formulating association and time series questions with um, Maxine and we've come back to the criteria and the criteria hold even across the different types. Mm -hmm. Now I know that in the real world, uh, statisticians are a lot looser with their questions that they pose and that's fine. But for kids who are learning to be statisticians, we have to be much more precise because they don't understand the gray or the flexibility that adults with lots of experience have. So hopefully I've answered that question. Chris, you might want to add something to that. 
No, I, I think that's, a, that's exactly what I would say as well. Okay, so another question that came in in the chat, um, this person writes, I always have difficulty assisting students in high school with proper questions for which data will be available and manageable and questions that will produce investigations that will align with the lessons or concepts. I guess that's more of a statement than a question, but the implied question is what's good advice on, uh, on that, right? Um, coming up with questions that align with lessons or concepts for which data are available and, and manageable. That's really the art of our role as a teacher, isn't it? And I'm doing some work at the moment. I'm developing a book for um, New Zealand. And one of the one of the challenges is, is getting data. And it's constant. Like in New Zealand, we have you know, stats is in from, from year one, and we do stats all the way to year 13. And from year 11, our last three years of school, we have formal qualifications and students have to do statistical investigations. And one of the biggest challenges for teachers is to find a purposeful data set. Um, making it data available and manageable. There is so much data available out there. That, that's the problem, there's almost too much. And when you find it, it has multiple variables and it's huge, like it might be thousands of cases. And we only need I'm going to say a handful, well, I don't quite mean a handful, but we, we use often when I'm starting with students and de definitely when I did my PhD, we were looking at smallish samples. I was mostly focusing on sample to population questions. So students were learning to write questions about a population, investigative questions about a population, then use a sample to answer that. And we in New Zealand have census at school, which is now in its 10th iteration. So we're just in the process of collecting data using census at school, and that provides us with databases. And we can go to that database, and in fact, I could show you quickly, but uh, we can go to that database and we can download a sample of um, 30, 100, up to 1,000 students. So in terms of getting data that's manageable and useful, we have the census at school database. And then I quite often will go and have a look at what's on the code app. Um, they have a number of databases on there. And then you can hunt all of the government websites, but as soon as you start hunting through databases, you've then got a lot of work. And for a teacher that can take hours and hours, and then you, you, you look at it and you go, oh, actually I am going to, if I can make it work, I'm gonna, I'm going to just show you census at school. Hopefully, can you see my, my purple? Let yes. me just show you census at school. So this is our New Zealand website that we have. Unfortunately, I get the little. Um, Okay, so in here, you'll see we've got take part because it's a current year for taking part in the census. And that's going to take ages to come in. All right, well, let's go into data. So in here, this is our data page. And if I click on download or explore a sample, and anyone in the world can access this, and this is where I say we've got lots of databases. So you see we've got from 2005 every year, we've got all of these databases here, including a couple of uh, ones that I made for my research. But if I go in, I can now select, so say for example, I'm working with year seven students, I can just select year seven students. And then I can select specific variables. So one of the things that's amazing about this database, if you ever want to use it, is you can be very particular about what you, you select. So I know I've got year seven, so I might be interested in gender, eye color, handedness, and height. And I might want to know how they get to school and how they how long it took them. And I, that might be all I want to look at. And then I can just enter a sample size, say 50, and I can generate a sample. And then I can download it or I can analyze it. And I usually download it and drop it into Kodak, but if I want to analyze it, it drops into Insight Light. And this is usually where I um, click on Visualize. No, I never can get that bit right. But anyway, 
all of that aside, you can get quite easily get a data set from there. I don't know if that helped that person that was asking about. But that's a great choice. We'll, we'll put this uh, URL in the um, information that we send out to folks later. Aside from misspelling the word color, I think it's really a wonderful um, resource oh, there. Yeah. <laughs> there's lots of things that will be misspelled. <laughs> The other thing if people are in there is there's a whole lot of resources um, by our curriculum levels, mm -hmm. but you can always go in and have a look. It's, a, it's kind of a bit over the top some days. But the, New Zealand, the New Zealand Census at School site is just fabulous. And I highly recommend that uh, teachers uh, uh, explore this site. I wanted to also mention that if you're interested in US uh, census at school data that's available at the uh, American Statistical Association website. Okay, let me turn another a question that, that's come in from a participant. Uh, if I understood correctly, the interrog interrogative questions, interrogative questions, emerge during data collection questions and the analysis questions. Um, in this sense, I get the impression they are questions that motivate the data and analysis phases of an investigation. I also think that the interrogative questions looks like those of the interrogative cycle. What do you think? Well, they, they can also, uh, you can also use interrogative questions before you even formulate your statistical investigative question. And I would think that uh, we use them also once we are at the interpret stage. So uh, maybe once you've interpreted your data, you now realize there's other questions that you might need to ask and maybe new data that you need to collect. So I think what you just stated is true, but I would also see them at the other two stages as well. Okay, and another question that came in from my good friend, Henny Cranadoc. Um, what I really like about this is that any, uh, Attempt to have students conduct a stat study requires something before they actually form the statistical question. They have to think about that and then start asking what it is they know and do not know about what they want to study. I think, however, there's a point where the students or the study actually forms the stat slash investigative question. So my question is this, raising lots of questions before, during, and so on is important but should there not be an umbrella question that drives the investigation? And that question I contend would be the statistical question. So sometimes, Jeff, what happens is we just have one question we want to answer. But I think generally we have an overarching problem that we want to solve. So if I was setting it up with my class, I might have an overarching problem or an overarching theme. And then from there, I'll pull out specific statistical investigative questions that I'm going to get data and pull plots and then analyze. But often our overarching problem is a bit, um, a bit ill-defined and not precise enough for us to be able to actually answer. So for example, if we look back right at the start of the um, presentation we started with what is it what does the thing we talked about what do ladybugs usually look like but that's really hard to answer so we then need to be a bit more precise in fact what we, so we start looking at how many spots do ladybugs typically have now i can answer that question because i can go and collect data about the number of spots but to answer what do ladybugs usually look like i've got to decide what i actually want to know that one would be more of the overarching and maybe might be a statistical question. The problem when I started, when I started doing my research, I absolutely went out and said, what makes a good statistical question? That was the question I was trying to answer. I was reading the Gay's book, it had not long been out, and I couldn't find a single answer to that question. What I found was that people would sometimes be talking about the statistical question, meaning the investigative question. And other times I'd be talking about the statistical question, meaning a data collection question. Mm -hmm. So even back then, people were confused about what they were calling a statistical question. And that's when, in the early days, that's when, so we're, we're actually we're talking about two quite different purposes here. One is the per one question I'm asking of the data, 
and one question I'm asking to get the data. And that was sort of where it all started, was this confusion back then. So I think you're right, yes, you do have an overarching statistical question often, and out of that will drop a whole lot of investigative questions, a question we, that we want to answer using data. Okay. So another question that came in is, how do you codify what you present for teachers in terms of a formal process or, or framework? And you might say, please read our paper where we go into much more detail <laughs> about this, but um, I'll let you answer. That was actually going to be my first response. <laughs> yes, I hope you all are reading the, uh, our journal. And again, Pip and Chris today, in just a short time, presented uh, some important ideas. But in their paper, they have time to go into much more depth about, uh, about some of this. I don't know if there's a short answer you can give beyond that. Uh, or maybe the really, it's a longer answer that is best addressed by reading the paper? I think the short answer is we probably formally deal with investigative questions and data collection questions and the other two happen as part of the process of teaching and learning and I think for teachers they need to be really clear about the purposes. I don't think kids necessarily need to know the difference between an analysis question and an interrogative question at the early stages. It's just part of, they to me are the thinking, that's the statistical thinking process. Okay, and so another I'm question. Interrogating science. Another you know, question that actually came in um, is just to highlight what is the clear difference between interrogative question and analysis questions? So analysis questions we ask of our graphs and displays. Mm -hmm. But when I'm, when I'm writing a description or a, trying to interpret the results. So the questions I ask to write their description, and generally they're just in my head, but as teachers, when we're teaching kids, we say them out loud. So, so it might be, I go, what is the shape of the distribution? What's the maximum value? What's the minimum value? What's the median? Where's most of the values? Those are the analysis questions. So the ones that I'm asking as I look at my graph. The interrogative questions, they were the things we highlighted in purple all the way through. So when I, when I write my investigative question, I interrogate it. Can I find the variable? What's the population? What sort of question, am I, what sort of investigation am I doing? When I write my data collection question, what do you mean by spot? It's those things that we are, you, you ask as checks and balances, right at the start, we said interrogative questions are about checks and balances. They're the things that you're in your head usually asking to check that what we're doing is right. Does it make sense with what I know? When I get my answer to my investigative question, does this make sense with what I know about ladybugs? Does it make sense that red ladybugs have more spots than black ladybugs? Does that reflect what I've seen in the data to date or what I've seen in real life? So as you said, read the paper. And we've deliberately picked a different example in the presentation to what's in the paper. So the example in the paper is not about the ladybugs. It's about, I think it's about sleep and extracurricular activities for high school students. So that should give you another. And at any time, feel free to contact myself or Chris if you want to know more. And um, I think there's a few more papers coming out this year that will, again, delve into this questioning more and more. And, and uh, we're about out of time, but one last question is, do you ever use mind mapping to formulate questions? No, I haven't, but I do use a version of a fishbone diagram to start to think about what the context is that I'm looking at, and from there to start to formulate my investigative questions. But that would be a wonderful way to do it. And by the way, in the paper, I'm seeing uh, roller coaster data, which is mm -hmm. a fun thing since it's that time of year in the US when roller coasters are operating and without COVID, we can actually go there for vaccinated. But we are really uh, a little bit past the advertised time uh, for this. And so I'm going to ask us to do uh, thank our speakers and uh, wrap this up. And again, we will be posting the, um, the, the slides and the talk and the uh, URL for the census, uh, it's new.census.atschool.org.nz. The, the panelists can see that, but I don't think the participants can see that. Um, 
new.census at school, all one word, .org.nz uh, is the, the one uh, site that Pip showed us a few minutes ago. Right. So again, uh, I think we'll, we'll close things there because we are a bit over the advertised time. Uh, thank you again, uh, Pip and Chris, both for the presentation and for the article that uh, is behind all of this. And thank you participants for joining us today. There'll be uh, more webinars coming up in the future. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you for letting us be here, Jeff.